Just, just grab a seat and we're going to get started and we're going to be um, broadcasting on YouTube as well at the same time just so people know that I'll introduce people and I'll get underway. Thank you everyone and welcome to the Canadian Environmental Law Association and our space here at the Cooperative for Specialty Clinics Ontario. And uh, we're very pleased to be co-sponsoring this event along with Friends of the Earth and uh, to bring um, the lawyers who brought a precedent setting legal case dealing with pesticides uh, to a successful conclusion uh, in the United States. Um, CELA is a Legal Aid uh, Specialty Clinic funded by Legal Aid Ontario, and one of our areas of service is to provide public legal education. We're very pleased that a number of uh, members of the bar have joined us today, and we hope to be able to provide events like this more often in the future now that we have this space. And uh, for those of you who aren't already aware, you can opt to be on CELA's lawyer referral list just by giving us your name and coordinates and, uh, and we'll add you. Um, we also welcome those participating online uh, via YouTube. Questions will be saved for the end and now B. Olivastri will introduce our speakers. Thank you, Teresa. It's um, terrific that CELA has co-sponsored both the event last night for the concerned public as well as today's strategic briefing on glyphosate. Um, Friends of the Earth, a louder. <clears throat> Again, just louder. louder. Yeah. Okay, so Friends of the Earth is extremely excited about having uh, three lawyers today, two of whom are from the warmer climate of Los Angeles. So they're heroic, heroic both for coming here in the middle of the frigid weather and deemed by their colleagues as the trial lawyer team of the of the year last year for just I guess a week ago uh, for their Monsanto trial last year so they're we're really excited <laughs> yay about having them here and uh, so the way we set this up is is to invite Michael Baum and uh, Brent Wisner from Baum Headland to talk to us about their the key experiences from their case against Monsanto and the ongoing work, but because there are some very specific uh, tactics and decisions they've made in that case that I think their knowledge and, and sharing here with Canadians who might want to litigate. And speaking for Friends of the Earth, I would say the response we're hearing from the Minister of Health in Canada suggests that the work on any policy or any reform, an independent science review with what we want, is pretty slow coming if it comes. We, we hope and expect the minister will take up our request to uh, move past the PMRA decision lately um, to not strike an independent panel, but considering that she may not, we need to learn about litigation opportunities in Canada. And so I'm very, very excited that Michael and Brent will share with us. And then Joe Pistrilli, who is one of the veterans of environmental law in Canada, has also taken the time to think about opportunities, and I'll admit, constraints. Uh, I think that we, we all have more of a, uh, I guess, a sense of experience around policy and regulatory change, but I think it's time to look at both the litigation opportunities as well as the policy um, and regulatory change. So Joe will speak to that following Michael and Brent. Um, so enough for me. I'm going to turn this over to Michael. I think he might have some breaking news to share as well. Well, uh, I'll bring that up as I went through it. So um, one of the first things I want to impress upon you is uh, that how delighted we are that you're here uh, despite the weather. Uh, and that uh, there are other uh, places around the world that are focusing in on uh, the way Monsanto has manipulated the science uh, relative to glyphosate Roundup. Um, what, one of the things that we've been able to do in the litigation in the U.S. is get access to their internal documents and have them shown to our experts to compare against 
against what the science is that uh, uh, Monsanto has been saying is the truth, or EFSA has been saying is the truth, or the EPA or Canada Health, with respect to glyphosate. It turns out when you compare our uh, internal documents against what the experts and analysts analyses are, uh, the, there are serious scientific gaps in what Monsanto, the EPA, EFSA, Canada Health have been saying about the safety of Roundup and a glyphosate. Um, so uh, I'm going to, what is, one of the things that we have done is by getting these documents, uh, we can undergo a process of getting them declassified as confidential. And uh, what we've been doing is as we get them declassified, we're posting them on our website at bobhedlinlaw.com. So can you, um, well, uh, pop up the first slide and I'll come back to you. Um, Can't hear me? Yeah, uh, uh, I hope I stand up like that? Yes. Okay. So, um, uh, the documents that we've unsealed, all the exhibits to the trial that led, that, that these documents led to getting a $289 million verdict in San Francisco, uh, in August last year, um, all of those documents are on our website, bombheadlinlaw.com. They're available for anybody to look at. Uh, they're organized. There's a, an outline that you can go through that's uh, searchable. Uh, they're, uh, we're, they're categorized by topic, and um, you have uh, the exhibits to the trial, the, uh, the transcripts to the trial so you can see all the testimony of the experts you can see all the documents that went into evidence um, and you can see the opening and closing arguments uh, that Brett did brilliantly and uh, they are you know essentially a trial in a box for anybody who wants to engage cases against Monsanto relative to life safe roundup and one of the things we'd like to encourage to occur here, I know that there's an impediment of uh, loser pays and there's some concerns about like who can sue for what here. Uh, and I think maybe Joe and, and Brent will answer questions about those. However, uh, the advantage that, that we have, that you have now is you've seen us go through it. And you've seen, you've got the documents, you've got the experts, uh, you've got the opening and closing arguments. Uh, you see the defenses that they they have uh, so far tried to present uh, against the documents and against our evidence and how they fail. And you should be in a, a pretty good position to mount some form of a viable case here as well. Uh, and we're happy to help with something like that. Uh, I've approached uh, yesterday but with a person here who used uh, Roundup as a kid and got not Hodgkin's lymphoma by the time he was a teenager and um, and is willing to be a class rep. Uh, if you can find viable class reps to do classes here, class uh, actions are actually more viable here and than in the U.S. in this arena uh, with regard to with uh, personal injury damages. Um, so I wanted to like, give you all that as a prelude that you, there's this big uh, database of documents and testimony and expert opinions and expert reports that are all available on our website. And it's uh, made it extremely convenient for analyzing it, using it, and uh, uh, understanding what Monsanto has actually been up to with respect to uh, presenting a safe, uh, an incorrect image of the safety of Roundup. So, uh, with that, I'm going to come over here and, and flip through some documents that we have um, uh, obtained in discovery. And Yeah. 
It's just the beginning. Where? Oh, here you are. Okay. All right. So. Yeah, let's we'll swap chairs. Actually, I'll get that one from our sheet because this one has cables in the way. Okay, so uh, what I've done is I have a PowerPoint, which you can all have as well, uh, which uh, summarizes some of the uh, key uh, evidence that. What are you saying? Sorry, that uh, we use for uh, uh, as I call the paper trail to the uh, $289 million verdict. Um, and uh, one of the things that, that was a key element of um, the trial was their suppressing information that showed a negative uh, relationship between Roundup or glyphosate and carcinogenicity. And in uh, 1991, after some pretty sketchy animal studies had been used to get Roundup on the market to begin with, and Brent will probably talk some more about that, uh, Monsanto pressured the U.S. EPA to place Roundup in category E as not likely to be carcinogenic. However, within a few years, uh, some European non-industry funded studies showed that Roundup was linked to inducing DNA damage in tissue studies. Uh, so Monsanto had a problem, and um, uh, they had uh, a concern that having been approved with a certain set of studies that were pretty flimsy to begin with, that these uh, independent studies would invalidate their uh, approval and make it so that there would have to be a warning label a warning on the label that there's carcinogenicity related to months to Roundup or glyphosate. So uh, they hired a, a famous, a well-known uh, uh, genotoxicologist to analyze these studies that were showing up in Europe uh, that were not industry controlled. And that was one of, that's one of the big themes throughout this litigation and in the big fight with the regulatory agencies around the world. Uh, Monsanto and the regulatory agencies like to focus in on the industry funded studies, most of which are kept secret from people like you or uh, academics or litigators or they, they keep those studies secret uh, for competitive reasons and uh, for their ability to influence the regulators and what they do is they summarize those studies and the summaries convey an, uh, the concept that it's safer than it actually is. And then what's been found in Europe is that uh, EFSA, the BFR, copy and pasted most of those summaries into their, their analyses. So you're actually seeing the not a regulatory agency's analysis, you're seeing Monsanto and the glyphosate task force analysis. So um, that, be, that they had these independent studies showing a problem was a real problem for them and so they hired uh, this guy Dr. James Perry to sort of massage the, the studies and come out with a conclusion that they liked. Unfortunately what he concluded was that these studies provide some evidence that Roundup mixture produces DNA lesions in vivo probably due to the production of oxidative damage. So these are from a, a series of, of uh, internal emails uh, that are available online. Uh, and what uh, the, the chief uh, toxicologist for Monsanto is saying is that uh, the guy we hired didn't turn in the, the outcome we wanted. He found exactly what the industry, the industry the non-industry studies showed. And um, his analysis corroborated what they, the independent studies were showing rather than refuted them. Uh, so uh, what they did, you'd think, well, okay, maybe we, an, an ethical company would say, okay, well, we better apply the precautionary principle. We better investigate this. We never have done you know, long-term carcinogenicity studies on uh, animals, it's time for us to do that. And they didn't do that. 
Instead, uh, what they did was, uh, here, this is uh, an email to one of their, again, one of their chief scientists, William Hydens, uh, to uh, Donna Farmer, their chief toxicologist. Um, we, we want to find, develop someone who is comfortable with the genotox profile of glyphosate Roundup, but who can be influential with regulators and scientific outreach operations when, when genotox issues arise. My read is that Perry is not currently such a person, and it would take quite some time and dollar signs, dollars, studies to get him there. We simply aren't going to do the studies Perry suggests. Okay, so that's their being upset with his outcome, and instead of doing some things uh, to protect the people that are exposed to Roundup, they're going to bury the study, not do the studies he recommends to determine whether there's an actual carcinogenicity problem that the, these studies are, are uh, suggesting exists, and they're going to find um, someone else to work with. Um, if not, we should seriously start looking for one or more individuals to work with. Um, so, uh, what they did, instead of having publishing Perry's work, giving it to the EPA, giving it to the EFSA, giving it to Canada Health, Canada Health, they buried it. And they had an obligation to disclose that analysis, and they should have done uh, passed that along to academics and regulatory agencies, and, so that legislators make good decisions, but they didn't. They hid it. And what they did instead was they uh, found uh, Gary Williams, Robert Crows, and Ian Monroe to publish this article, Safety Evaluation and Risk Assessment of the Herbicide Roundup and its Active Ingredient Glyphosate for Humans. And they concluded that there wasn't a carcinogenicity problem, there wasn't a genotox problem. They delivered the concept that they wanted. Now, at the time, they were viewed as independent scientists who had arrived at an independent conclusion, and that sort of put to, to, to rest that these concerns that these European studies were showing. And this particular article was relied upon by academics who did epidemiology studies. They cited it. It was cited many times by regulators and by academics for years as the bedrock of science, oh, this issue is put to, dead, to bed. However, uh, as a result of the documents that we got in Discovery, we found out that that article had been ghostwritten by Monsanto, and they were not independent scientists. Uh, this is that same Bill Hydens that we had, uh, saw before, and this is when they're discussing what to do about IARC having an independent agency, having evaluated the science, having evaluated the epidemiology, the toxicology, and the uh, mechanistic studies that showed that there was a connection, each corroborating each other, that there was a connection with carcinogenicity. Um, they had to attack IARC. And so they were going to create an, an expert panel to go do that for them. And so they want to do an overall plausibility paper that we discussed with John, uh, John Aquavella, the scientist that they want to, a uh, former Monsanto employee that's going to be on this expert panel that's going to be independently gathered up by a Canadian group called Intertech. Um, so he says he's having trouble wrapping his mind around it. And if we went, went full bore involving experts from all major areas, epi, that's epidemiology, toxicology, genotoxicology, uh, mechanism of action, exposure, not sure what we'd get. We could be pushing $250,000 or even more. Again, this is supposed to be an independent study that they're that's supposed to, re, to rebut IARC because there are independent scientists out there that don't agree with IARC. Um, a less expensive, more palatable approach might be to involve experts only for the areas of contention, epidemiology and possibly mechanism of action, dependent on what comes out of IARC, the IARC meeting. So this is the another point here is that this is their planning. This is February 19th, 2015. IARC didn't publish its opinions 
uh, that, uh, that's conclusion until March 15th. So they're planning ahead before even, even seeing what IARC's methodology, what they cited, they, they had like a, a 90 page single space paper that they write called a monograph that uh, goes through their complete analysis and explains how they arrived at there was uh, a carcinogenicity connection. And they don't have that yet, but they've already decided that they're going to refute it and attack it. And so, um, <laughs> So they're concerned about the cost of, of collecting up all these independent scientists. An option would be to add Grime and Keir or Kirkland to have their names on the publication. So that's one of their tricks is to get supposedly independent academics, put their names on a paper that's been sponsored or written by Monsanto to, to make it look like it's independent science. So people like regulators think they're getting independent science when they're not. And, the sentence before that, they actually specify it goes right next to it. Before. Oh. Just before that. Uh, and possibly a mechanism. And we ghostwrite. Well, I was getting right over there. So, um, so they're going to get these people together, uh, depending on what comes out of the IARC meeting. And instead of like paying these guys all the money it would take to write their own studies, we're go we ghostwrite the exposure tox and genotox section. An option would be to add Grime and Cure or Kirkland to have the names on the publication. But we would, we would be keeping the cost down by us doing the writing, and they would just edit and sign their names, so to speak. Recall that is how we hand handled Williams, Crow, and Monroe 2000. Now, that's this article here they're referring to. So instead of being independent science for the preceding, you know, uh, 15 years, was that, yeah, 15 years, that w turned out to have been a ghostwritten article that the world didn't know about was ghostwritten. And Michael, just so everyone knows, the CBC is doing a really interesting in-depth look into these papers coming out of the 21st in French and in English. Um, and they're going to spend a lot of time looking at this Monroe guy. So that's my teaser. <laughs> I promised them I wouldn't give them their story away before I came out. But it's going to get really interesting about this Monroe. He's a Canadian scientist, so it's interesting. So, um, One of the issues that's important in uh, all this story and, and what uh, the PMRA has done and what uh, the EPA has done and EFSA have done, most of that research has been, and the science has been, on glyphosate alone, the, the active molecule that um, uh, kills plants, supposedly, and uh, the surfactant with, that is added to it to help it spread out and penetrate the waxy surface of, of plants and skin, as it turns out. And um, they had uh, early internal knowledge that it, when you combined these surfactant with the active molecule, they synergistically had a, ba a, a bad effect. They were more toxic together than they were separately. But the regulators only required them to do testing on the separate uh, molecules separate uh, for, uh, chemicals and uh, as you all probably know that sometimes you can mix you know one plus one with chemicals doesn't always equal two the synergistic effect can have a chemical reaction that comes out five or ten and with respect to the toxicity of glyphosate its ability to it doesn't penetrate surfaces by itself very well the adjuvant helps it penetrate waxy or oily surfaces. And that's how it gets inside skin. That's how it gets inside bodies, how it gets inside vesicles under the skin. It has an, an, uh, an interaction with the lymph system that le leads to lymphoma. Uh, it's also how it gets through the waxy surface of plants. The glyphosate goes in, interferes with the protein uh, chain, uh, forming amino acids that uh, uh, make proteins and kills the plants. But by itself, it doesn't get very far. It's not that penetrable of a chemical, but the, the addition of the adjuvant, the surfactant, makes it get more toxic. And so uh, they had known that for a long time. 
uh, back in 1999. We've got Donna Farmer again. I will not support doing any studies on glyphosate formulations or other surfactant in ingredients at this time with the limited informa information we have on that situation. Uh, they, uh, if somebody came to me and said they wanted to test Roundup, I would know how I would react with serious concern. We have to really think about doing formulations, even if they are not on the market. And uh, uh, you cannot say that Roundup, that's the formulation, does not cause cancer. We have not done carcinogenicity studies with Roundup. On the formulations, they had not done studies. Um, and they didn't want studies to be done because they didn't want to see the outcome. Um, so uh, what they have done uh, generally as a, a plan of action over time, they had uh, different variations of this. They called it whack-a-mole. They called it let nothing go. They call it IMT issues, issues management team. They, if somebody says something negative about uh, glyphosate or Roundup, they get attacked. And some people here probably know that. If you've, any of you have tweeted or emailed or, or blogged something negative about IR, there's a group of trolls that come after you. And uh, some of you, Rachel, you know that. And uh, I think Mike Watson, I, I, there are people here that know that that's what they do. And there's a team that they've got assigned to it, and they have battle plans that they create. And so what they did with respect to IARC, IARC was one of the biggest uh, threats to them because they were independent scientists. They were independent scientists that were uh, evaluating uh, published literature and peer-reviewed, um, uh, published peer-reviewed literature by independent scientists that they didn't fund, they didn't have control of, and they didn't have a dog in the fight. They, they, um, sorry. Um, and because they didn't have a dog in the fight and they weren't being funded by, uh, uh, by Monsanto or the Glyphosate Task Force or the Crop Life America or Crop Life Europe, they were able to arrive at conclusions at just what the science showed. They didn't spin it. They, sh they looked at what the, uh, the ex human exposures were. They looked at the exposures to animals, and they looked at exposures uh, in health tissues. And they all corroborated, the three pillars of science corroborated, there's a connection between uh, Roundup and carcinogenicity. So they embarked on, and with respect to IARC, they, they, they instead of, again, applying the precautionary principle, and maybe decided to actually do a long-term carcinogenicity rodent study on the formulated product, they decided to defend Monsanto by discrediting IR. They had detailed plans for this. It wasn't, they had multiple PowerPoints and uh, 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 battle plans, single space, multiple pages of things to do, which reporters to contact and feed stories to, which academics to contact to have them uh, blog or, or, or speak out against IR, which uh, regulators, people they have within the regulators to go contact, which uh, legislators to go after to, uh, to cause hearings to occur to defund IR. They had a multifaceted, it was like D-Day uh, that they had so so much planning that went into uh, this multifaceted attack on uh, IR. So here's what they were planning to do. Just wanted to let you know we have long been concerned having glyphosate is on for an IR review, uh, and they know that they have vulnerability in the areas of uh, uh, epidemiology, and uh, uh, so so that we also have potential vulnerabilities in the other areas that IARC will consider, namely exposure, genotox, and mode of action. They're acknowledging there they, ha they have vulnerabilities for the liability that would be shown uh, by those areas of science. And instead, again, of do you applying the precautionary principle and investigating those, they're going to attack the messenger. 
So one of the uh, things to do is orchestrate outcry with the IARC decision. And uh, they had multiple ways of doing that. These documents, these internal documents are on our website and they're all available to read. You'll go, if you are interested at all on how Monsanto has maintained the safety, the parent safety with uh, the regulators, this is how they did it. Uh, they're going to invalidate the relevance of IARC. Um, well, <laughs> they're taking them out. Oh my God! So uh, one of the, the issues has been that they, uh, in California, as a Proposition 65 is a law that was passed that said that if IARC makes a determination that something is carcinogenic, they ha they have to list it on uh, in California as a chemical likely. Uh, to cause cancer in humans and are likely to cause cancer. And uh, they were trying to prevent that listing from occurring because it would be bad for their sales. This is a conversation between uh, the head of sales for Monsanto and their distributor in California. And they're, it's part of a chain of communications where they're actually talking about how they're going to lose money because schools you know, uh, ha use uh, Roundup on their yards where kids are playing and they don't want to lose that money and so they're being overrun by liberals and morons sort of like a zombie movie so we just have to start taking them out uh, one at a time starting with the elections next year that's their mentality it is not you know the principle of looking out for the health and safety of the people who are exposed to their products it's not uh, doing things that are right for their communities it's how they're going to keep their sales up and take out their opponents, just like a zombie movie. So, um, do you have internet on there? Yes. Can you just Google liberals and morons, uh, type of sick girl, show them the graphic? Yeah, she's oh. <laughs> yeah, can you do that? So, during the trial, there were a number of uh, bloggers and reporters that what watched it, of and one of them was called uh, Glyphosate Girl, who um, uh, wrote very clever summaries of what happened each day. And she would have a graphic that would be associated with uh, what happened. And she was, when this uh, document was first shown, uh, the first line says day 12. Yeah, there we go. Yeah. The graphic is funny. There. This is challenging our technical capability to oh. switch screens. <laughs> oh, you don't have it up there. Yeah, that's put it up there. Okay. I was seeing it in my screen. Oh, it's so coming. Yes. Yeah. Right. Okay. When you were moving it to the right. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Bear with me. Just move it to the right. I think it'll pop right on. There we go. Nope. Yeah. No, you have to move it off of your screen content. There it is. Oh, I see. Keep going. Keep going. Okay. <laughs> there you go. So she actually made us hats with this on it. She made a little uh, <laughs> label across, you know, like like you know, for Toronto Maple Leafs. Instead, it was this. <laughs> So, um, can you go to that article or something? Yeah. To you? So, um, the documents we have all currently declassified are on our website. We have declassified another 300 documents that we're getting ready to put up on the, our website. They're not there yet. And But today, uh, Ramon published an article about a bunch of those uh, documents that are about to come out. And one of a uh, group of those documents relates to uh, in the part of that orchestrate outcry was they assembled papers that made it look like uh, that, that one of the IARC uh, panels members had hit a study that was showed a negative relationship or a lack of relationship between Roundup and uh, carcinogenicity. Um, IARC only uses published, peer-reviewed material 
not th things that are in progress of being written, not things that are unpublished, not things that are uh, not peer reviewed. This article um, is, uh, was, no, there was an article that came out uh, after uh, the IR uh, findings were uh, published and said, oh, IARC tricked people. There was uh, one of the principal uh, authors and leaders of the IARC panels had hit a study that was uh, showed a negative relationship. And if, it would, if they had actually used that study, it would have, uh, they would have uh, not found the connection between uh, Roundup or glyphosate and carcinogenicity. That was false. And, it, and they, but they used a, a couple of phrases from this guy's deposition and sent it to a reporter, Kate Kellen at Reuters. She cited that and it turned out that that article was used to, um, was broadcast around the world. It was used in, in, uh, as an exhibit in litigation to prevent the, uh, uh, the labeling of uh, products that had glyphosate in it as being carcinogenic in, ca in uh, California. It was fed to legislators in uh, U.S. Congress to hold a hearing to defund IARC because they were not reliable and they were, their methodology, uh, this showed their methodology to be uh, un um, scientific. This article shows that uh, a guy named Sam Murphy inside Monsanto, create a slide deck that summarized the, these uh, bullet points that twisted the testimony of uh, Aaron Blair and twisted uh, the documents showing that there, it wouldn't have made any, he said that uh, it was unpublished, it wouldn't have made any difference in his vote, there was another contrary study that said that there was a connection that he didn't publish and did not use in the IR evaluation either. They, they offset each other and it didn't make any difference. But they didn't publish that. They took the Monsanto spin and spread that everywhere. And they used that to invalidate IARC's funding. They used it to create legislation to change their methodology. IARC is one of the very few agencies around the world right now protecting people with independent science. Independent science is hard to fund. You know, you cannot get it done. And um, people like uh, Sarah Lini, uh, people like um, uh, Anthony Samsel, uh, uh, Stephanie Seneff, they do the they fund themselves for the most part to get stuff done. It's not easy to get funding because uh, they show uh, they, they undermine the commercial um, impact, the availability, the commercial money that they're going to make from these products. So uh, this article just came out today. It kind of pulls a rug out from uh, underneath them on this particular article. It wasn't the only one they did. They did it with uh, a guy um, in Forbes magazine and had an article that was that was verbatim the same as uh, what was sent to them by uh, the Monsanto uh, guy implementing their orchestrate outcry against IR. So Michael, um, is this going to be a good segue, do you think, to Brent and Joe to make sure we have time? Oh, for I didn't know how much time you guys had. I'm, I'm essentially, I just wanted to say, uh, this is an ongoing thing. We're going to be uh, releasing more and more documents. Uh, read this article. It, it, it shows that the science that, that, that PMRA and Health Canada are relying on is being manipulated. And if you do the actual protocol and follow the actual guidelines without industry influence, you end up with the conclusion that there is a carcinogenicity problem that needs to be fixed around the world with respect to life around it. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I guess I'll get started. I'm going to be very quick because Michael covered a lot of really good stuff. Um, I think what I want to say quickly is just sort of how do you bring a lawsuit against Monsanto and prove that it caused your clients cancer? 
at least under California and most of the United States common law. Uh, it's a little different in a few states. I think Louisiana has an older system, but for the most part, these are the basic issues you have to do. I'm not doing a PowerPoint. I'm just going to do this off the top of my head. The first question you have to answer is, can it cause cancer? It's pretty straightforward. Specifically, not Hodgkin's lymphoma. Question number two, did it cause your client's cancer? That's a different question, right? One is, generally, is it capable of inducing cancer? And then, did it cause your client's cancer? <coughs> the third question, and this is usually pretty straightforward, is what were the damages that resulted from that cancer? And that can be complicated by a couple of issues. And then finally, the last question, and this is where a lot of what Michael was covering goes into, is did Monsanto do that or not warn properly uh, with malicious intent? They do with a reckless disregard for human life. And that last issue is what gets you to punitive damages, at least in the United States. So I'm going to quickly run through those four to kind of give you an overview of, of what we're able to do right now. So the first issue is can it cause cancer? And I'll just be frank. This is the entirety of Monsanto's defense. The remaining questions all kind of fall into line once you establish that it's capable of causing cancer. And at trial, Monsanto didn't actually mount any effective defense against the remaining questions. In fact, at the end, it was kind of sad watching the defense lawyer say, well, maybe we should have done that, but it wasn't intentional. These are good people. And the jury just didn't believe it, okay? So the first issue is, does it cause cancer? And to do that, Really, when it comes to cancer science, there are three pillars, okay? The first pillar looks at regular humans in the real world who are exposed to Roundup. We look at them and say, okay, those people who are exposed to Roundup, do more of them have non-Hodgkin's lymphoma than people who are not? And that's the simplicity of it. That's called epidemiology, right? In the realm of Roundup and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, there have been seven epidemiological studies done. All of them have been done by independent groups. Not one of them has been done by Monsanto, which is a, a liability thing that we developed throughout trial, saying, well, why didn't you do one? Why didn't you do one? And they kept saying, because there was no need for one. And then we'd show them emails where their own scientists are saying, gosh, we have a real problem in epidemiology. <laughs> this is really concerning. Oh my gosh, you keep finding out Hodgkin's and but we have like dozens of these documents. And when you put it into a timeline with Monsanto and with the studies coming out, it shows a really, and this is what I did at trial, I mean, this is, this, is, this is nothing surprising. We walk through the timeline and you go, oh gosh, these are horrible, they should have done something. In any event, there's been seven epidemiological studies. Of those seven, five of them are positive, and clearly positive. They show an association between Roundup exposure and non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. More importantly than just random exposure, they show a dose-response relationship. They show that if you just have a small amount of exposure to Roundup, there really is no increased risk. But when you spray it more often than not, so heavy users, the risk more than triples or doubles. And so that's, that's kind of the signal through the noise. And that's actually what some of the jurors said to us was, you know, a lot of the epi was confusing, but we saw that there was a dose response. And that really showed us that there was a problem. And actually, the most important dose response relationship study that was done was actually done on Canadians and looking at uh, farm workers in Canada about uh, who used it more frequently than others. And that actually is one of our better studies by Dr. McDuffie and her colleagues. Um, so that's the epidemiologist, pillar one. Pillar two is animal toxicology, okay? And what this is, is it's studies on rats and mice. That's what it is. Sometimes there's dog studies, but there hasn't actually been any around them. So really it's rats and mice. And what they do is they expose mice and rats to either nothing or different doses of glyphosate, okay? Not Roundup, but glyphosate. And they watch them for the entirety of their life, about two years for each, for each species. And then they, they, after they die, they euthanize them all. They dissect every one of their organs. They look at every piece of tissue to see if there's any tumors, okay? It's, it's pure laboratory condition, so it's fully controlled. Um, and what you have here is about 22 rodent studies that have been done, of which only 12 or 14, depending on who you ask, are, are, are reliable. So there's some of them that we all just agree is garbage. They were done by, by either by a fraudulent organization or everyone agrees. Monsanto, EP, everyone agrees that those studies are bad. So they're not really an issue. But the ones that are relevant of the 14, all of them but one, every single one but one, 
shows an elevated rate of tumors in rodents exposed to glyphosate. Okay, every single one. And interestingly enough, in the mice studies specifically, in all the studies that Monsanto didn't do, so Monsanto did one mouse study, but the four remaining studies after Monsanto all show elevated rates of lymphoma in mice exposed to glyphosate. So that's, that's sort of the animal toxicology data. And, you know, the, you know, the Canadian Health and EPA have all gone at length, and you can look at their documents talking about this, at like trying to dismiss these tumor findings with all these sort of machinations. <laughs> and we have our experts, and you show it to the jury, we have this great, it's called a tumor chart. And we lay out all the tumors found in all the studies and we color code them for the same tumors. We show that to the jury and it's just like, okay, it's really <laughs> causing tumors in, in animals. It's not really, it's not really a dispute. And they act, it was actually funny, a trial, they brought in their toxicologist who went up there with my chart and they made a new one where you could pull off the tumors off the thing. And he went through each one and explained why those tumors weren't really important. He'd take them and he'd throw them in a trash can right in front of the jury. And he thought they were being all clever doing that. And I came up on cross-examination. I go, sir, you just spent the last two hours throwing all these tumors in a trash can. You call that science? What did throw them away? Sir, you literally threw them and pulled the trash can. You threw them in a trash can. Oh, yeah, okay. So let's actually talk about how much work you had to do to ignore these tumors. And I walked him through it. And actually, at the end of the cross-examination, he actually admitted he was wrong. It was kind of a Perry Mason moment. He went, <laughs> I showed him the data, said, sir, that's the historical data. He was like, oh, yeah. Yeah, gosh, I must have been wrong. <laughs> and I was like, okay, great, no further questions. <laughs> um, and the funny part is before we got to that, it was all about numbers and data, so it was kind of complicated. Before I did the question, I asked him, I said, sir, you agree with me. Numbers are important. And he goes, you bet they are, especially when it's the numbers on my paycheck. <laughs> and he was trying to be all like, ha ha, jurors, I care about making a payday too, is like trying to relate to the jurors. But it just came across as terrible. And I went, okay, <laughs> great, <laughs> let's keep going. Anyway, so that was the animal toxicology section. And then the last one gets a lot more complicated. It's the sort of cell studies. And what this is, is they look at actual cells and how they respond. Oh, by the way, sorry, before we move on to that. On the animal toxicology section, the one thing that's really important is Monsanto, in fact, nobody has ever done that study on the formulated product. They've just done it on pure glyphosate. And as Michael was explaining to you, that's a huge scientific problem. It creates a sort of hole of data. The only scientist that ever tried to do it was a guy named Dr. Seralini, and he didn't even try to do it as a cancer study. He just did it as a toxicology study and let it go on for two years. And 80% of the rats in his study had tumors who were eating Roundup, 80%. I mean, it's a staggering finding. And if you look at the pictures of the rodents, they're, I mean, they have tumors that are the size of their body. It's, it's almost horrific. And the reality is his conclusion was you really need to do a formulated product study. And that was nine years ago. Monsanto refused. They actually orchestrated an entire attack against Serlini. We could spend an hour just talking about that. I won't. But the point is, why that's relevant is because we have the internal documents where Monsanto says, well, we can't do studies on the formulated product. That would set a dangerous precedent. If we did one study on one formulated product, we'd have to study all of them. And that's a $1.5 million <laughs> a study. That could take three years. We don't want to do that. And they actually say that in black and white. It's pretty, pretty ridiculous. Anyways, so that's animal toxicology. So then moving on to uh, the cell, cell studies, that's a little more complicated. There's hundreds, literally hundreds of studies that have been done. They really break down now into a couple categories. The first category is who you're studying. You have humans, you have mammals, you have animals that are not bacteria but not mammals, and then you have bacteria, okay? And then you also have petri dish studies, so just cell cultures that you're studying. And you actually have studies done in living animals or living things, okay, organisms. And so it breaks down to the sort of complicated division. The simple fact is, is the most important studies are done in humans who are living, right? That seems quite obvious. That would be most relevant to our experience. There's only been three studies done that looks at the effects of actual exposure on humans who are living. And all three of them are positive. All three of them, pretty clearly.
the most compelling one, and I kind of talked about this last night, so I don't want to repeat too much, was a study done in Ecuador and in Colombia where they use Roundup for cocaine eradication. And they have these, air, these big jets come down and spray villages with Roundup to kill the cocaine problems. Well, mothers, children, you know, other farmers, they're all getting exposed. And so some researchers said, hey, you know what, why don't we actually go into those villages and take their blood and see what's happening to them? And they compare that blood to villagers in other villages who are not being sprayed nearby and see if there's any difference. And they did it, and they discovered that people who were doused with the Roundup had significant amounts of genetic damage, which is the precursor to cancer. It's the only study that's been done. That Dr. Perry, who Michael referenced in, in, in the papers that did a study for Monsanto in early 2000, his big recommendation at the end of all of his study was, we should really go out and look at exposed people and see if there's any genotoxic damage occurring. He actually proposed that. Monsanto, of course, didn't do it. These other researchers did, and this is what they found. So, but on, on the cell studies, it's pretty complicated. But basically, when you do the full meta-analysis of it, when you look at everything and put it all together, it's pretty overwhelmingly strong evidence. And that's what IARC found. The EPA, well, the EPA and, and EFSA and, and PMRA, the way they look at it is very different. They don't look at Roundup. They just look at glyphosate. And then on top of that, they also give different weights to studies based on whether or not they're published and peer-reviewed versus regulatory studies. There's a great article written by Dr. Charles Benbrook. Uh, this came out about three weeks ago. He's actually an expert for us, but he, he did this on his own. And he goes through a systematic evaluation of all the cell studies. And it kind of explains why the EPA found what it did and why IARC found what it did because of the way they approached it. And for what it's worth, it's a great read. I think it sets up the, 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 the science nicely and I think helps explain why there's different views. Overall, the evidence is strong. So when you put all three of those pillars together, it shows that it causes cancer. Now Monsanto, in its hubris, uh, refuses to find, can't find a scientist that looks at all three pillars, right? They bring in an epi epidemiology specialist. They bring in a toxicology guy. They bring in a, a, a cell guy, although they never call that cell guy the trial because they're afraid. But they bring in, yeah, they're all siloed experts, okay? All of our experts looked at all of it. And so one of the things that I said to the jury in closing argument is I said, there's a reason why they can't bring in an expert that looks at all three. Because if you, if these are three pillars. It's like a, three, three legs of a chair, of a stool. You remove one of those legs, it falls over. Of course it doesn't stand. And so what they do is they bring in a bunch of experts with one leg on the stool and say, look at it, it can't stand. Well, that's because they're ignoring the rest of the science. Not one of those legs by itself shows that it causes cancer, but all three together, looked at it collectively, does. And they couldn't bring an expert that could testify about all three. And the, the jury actually acknowledged that. They found that compelling. That's question one. The next week's going go very quickly, I promise. I know. I feel the time. This guy needs to talk. I can explain the Canadian law. So. Um, <laughs> all right, question number two. Did it cause your person's cancer. And that's actually a relatively easy exercise, right? We know what generally causes non-Hodgkin's lymphoma, and we know what we don't know, right? So what I mean by that is there are a list of known risk factors associated with non-Hodgkin's lymphoma. HIV, hepatitis C, uh, a couple other complicated autoimmune disorders, other types of viral infections. There's a whole series of different things that we know can lead to non-Hodgkin's lymphoma because of the effect they have on the human immune system and our lymphosystem. You add to that list Roundup exposure. And if your client has had sufficient Roundup exposure such that they would fall into those categories we talked about in epidemiology, and there really isn't any other competing factor, then by process of elimination, the most likely cause of the cancer is the Roundup. And that's, that's the simplicity of what we present. We have an expert go through that process and explain it to the jury. Um, and our expert is a, a guy from University of Chicago. He happens to be one of the most handsome men I've ever seen in my life. <laughs> uh, he's tall, he's a dark, sexy voice. He's serious. He's serious. switching teams. He's serious. <laughs> gets my heart going. Uh, he's a deep voice. He's like hybrid. Shakes your hand, and you're like, oh. <laughs> you know, I have a girlfriend, right? <laughs> this guy, he just gets me going. And the jury, actually, in the jury room, 
when they what they did is they went through all the witnesses that testified. They put up a big sheet of paper for each witness, and they went through all their notes and said what each witness testified, the strengths and the weaknesses of that. This jury was brilliant. And for him, for his sheet, they put a big heart on it. <laughs> um, but in addition to him being very handsome, what I really like about him, though, is that he cares so much about people, and he comes through in his testimony. And when they try to attack him, he's always like, I don't really care about this. I care about helping people. And Monsanto always looks like a villain when they cross him. So he's phenomenal. And he always thinks he does a terrible job. He's like, bro, I screwed the case up. Like, no, you did great, I swear. But uh, anyway, he's great. So that's that's question two. Question three is damages. And that obviously is, you get complicated by, you know, the different effects. A lot of people have non Hodgkin's lymphoma can get cured. And so they're like, well, I had chemo. I went through some, some discomfort, but now I'm better. And so those cases don't seem like they have a lot of damages, right? It's not like Mr. Johnson, who literally was fighting for his life and had been going through this horrific experience. It's not every, it's not every circumstance. So obviously you have to show damages and there's different ways to do that. I can talk to you about, I mean, any trial lawyer knows that that's always an issue. And then the last question is Monsanto's conduct, right? And once you get to that point, then you start talking about punitive damages. You start talking about what is the amount of money that will cause this company to change its conduct? And uh, you know, there's lots of different ways of doing that. Um, and you know, we have different sort of techniques to sort of bring out uh, the impulse within people to protect one another. And that's actually not hard to do. People actually care about people, despite you know what we read in the news. And um, you know, what you do to get there is you have these stories. You have the Perry story, you have the Seralini story, you have the magic tumor story. These are all stories that I haven't talked about. Each one takes a couple of minutes to explain. But you have these stories that when you put them all together, there's no question this company acted with a reckless disregard for human life. They just didn't care. And um, it comes through in the way they respond to IARC and the ghost road. There's a whole bunch of stuff. And we have a mountain of evidence and the jury sees it. And really, then, at the end of the day, it becomes to what is the number that will cause them to change their conduct. And, you know, we've actually put together a nice little case. In the Johnson trial, we were only able to use about 20% of our evidence. And part of that was the judge being very hostile to us for reasons that we don't understand. Um, the other part was it just wasn't properly worked up. Uh, I brought, got brought into the trial just a few days before I went to trial. So there was, there was just foundational stuff that hadn't been done leading up to the trial. We've now filled in all those holes. I, I literally was taking Monsanto's deposition for 14 hours last week, filling in those holes. So the case is really good to go. And so that's sort of how we do it in the US. There's 10,000 cases filed. There's probably another 20,000 cases uh, in people have signed up and they haven't filed them yet. And we'll see where the litigation goes. But I think that it would be really valuable. Um, and maybe you can help kind of segue right into your presentation. How is that possible in Canada? I mean, we want to work with any lawyers here in whatever way you can to do this because, you know, Canadians and Americans are both humans. Uh, they're both getting sick. And you guys spray a lot of Roundup here per capita, actually more than the U.S. And so it's really, I think, going to be a health crisis within this country. And I'd like to know how we can help you guys navigate the sort of legal stuff by us giving you the evidence, the testimony of the experts kind of in a box and say, have at it. And if you even want us to come and try a case for you, I don't know if that'd be possible. Probably not. Okay. <laughs> we can. All right. Well, thank you for coming. Thanks very much, Brent. And so we're going to um, call on Joseph Castrilli, one of the lawyers uh, in our office at CELA. Um, an excellent litigator to talk about what are some of the Canadian considerations in a case like this. And then just to give you a bit of a road map, um, when Joe is uh, done, we'll have about 10 minutes of Q&A, then we'll have a, a break for people who didn't yet grab lunch to grab lunch, and then we'll resume for the um, discussion with Meg. Okay. Let's actually start with slide three. So um, <clears throat> what you've heard this morning uh, from our guests from California, um, the foundation, legal foundation for the, um, the case is uh, was known as strict products liability. 
the bottom line with strict products liability is that you do not have to show negligence or fault by the defendant. And um, they have explained um, uh, the evidence and some of the theory to you this morning, and obviously I don't need to repeat that. Um, next slide. Um, those five bullets are uh, the challenge that we face in Canada trying to bring a similar case. Um, I'm just going to go through them uh, initially um, uh, one at a time, and then I'll go into a little bit more detail for each of the five of them. Um, products liability in Canada is not based on strict liability. It's still based on negligence. I was reading some early American cases, and I think the Americans actually began uh, converting their law from negligence, uh, negligent products liability to strict products liability in the 1940s or 50s. So Canada is roughly 70 years behind, and um, that's uh, and there are no signs that uh, anyone or any particular jurisdiction in Canada is looking to change that. I leave out the province of Quebec, which is a civil law jurisdiction, where their um, their law is actually a lot closer to what you see in California. Um, secondly, there's the issue of uh, bringing um, problems in bringing suits as a class action, and I'll come back to that in a moment. Thirdly, the, uh, the use of juries um, in civil actions in Canada is extremely rare. Most cases are tried by judges alone. Uh, fourthly, the uh, damage awards uh, are low in Canada, both in terms of general damages and punitive damages, and I'll also explain why that's the case. And finally, um, the, um, the issue of paying for um, the costs of the, uh, the other side, should you lose, uh, can be a pretty um, a devastating all by itself. There was a case in Nova Scotia in the 1980s where um, uh, folks brought an action against um, a logging company for applying uh, 24D and 245T in the forests in Nova Scotia, Cape Breton. Um, the uh, case was not successful and they were dinged for um, uh, costs in the neighborhood of a quarter of a million dollars. And that was, what, 30 years ago? Um, that kind of problem um, is uh, clearly also an obstacle um, in considering uh, products liability actions in common law provinces across the country. Um, next slide. So, like American law, uh, uh, American products liability law, we basically have a three-tiered uh, approach to dealing with products liability as well. Manufacturer's defect, which as I understand it, was not at issue in the case in California. Basically, manufacturer's defect is um, the manufacturer did not intend uh, for a particular defect to end up in the product, and it's ended up causing harm to someone. Uh, the second aspect is design defect, and I understand that was a key portion of the uh, case in California. Design defect is where the company actually intends the defect that's causing the problem, and the impact of that defect is really uh, uh, across the board uh, and, and affects every single product produced because of the, um, the, the design uh, defect in the product to begin with. And finally, there's failure to warn, and that's also on the basis of strict liability notions. Um, although, in I think in, in the California case, failure to warn, uh, the, the company was also held liable uh, on the basis of negligent failure to warn as well as uh, strict, on strict uh, products liability basis. That is not what we have in Canada. Uh, we have negligence theory as the foundation for liability under all three of those aspects of products liability in the common law provinces, uh, the nine provinces, seven except Quebec. Quebec's a different story. I'm not an expert on civil law in Quebec, but their law is, as I said earlier, a lot closer to what the, um, the law is in California. Uh, next slide. Uh, the Phillips versus Ford case, which is now roughly 50 years old, is still pretty much the, um, the standard for um, uh, the, the law of products liability in Canada. You basically have to show as as this Court of Appeal judgment excerpt indicates, that um, uh, reasonable care was exercised, and that's all that needs to be shown. And if you, in fact, can show reasonable care, even if your product causes harm, you are not going to be found liable. And that kind of result has occurred in more than one case in, in Canada. Um, next slide. 
Joe, is the Monsanto story suggesting reasonable care is uh, not being shown? Uh, based on what I heard this morning, that's certainly a reasonable argument to make. Yeah. <laughs> um, but it's a tougher standard. <laughs> it's a tougher standard to deal with. I mean, the Americans changed the standard for an obvious reason. Everybody was losing who was a plaintiff. And um, that's not occurring any longer, but that is still occurring here. We'll keep the visitor for Monsanto out the end. Um, Stay out there. Uh, the, uh, this, this slide simply shows, again, the problems with uh, basing your law on negligence as opposed to strict liability. Um, move on to the next slide. Class actions. Uh, Michael's correct. Class actions actually are a, are a better option. Uh, particularly when you're, and I was listening to the number of experts that apparently were available for, for the plaintiffs, and uh, that uh, would be um, a, a, a problem here as well in terms of being able to actually uh, pay for them. But um, uh, the beauty of class actions is that you can then uh, combine the resources of many harmed folks uh, for the purposes of uh, being able to try and put a case together. So at that level, a class proceeding is certainly something that, would want, that one would want to consider. But there are problems in Canadian law and in the common law provinces, particularly in Ontario, with uh, class proceedings. Uh, one of them uh, being uh, the one that's identified in the, um, in the second bullet that, um, uh, or should be identified in the second bullet, um, that um, there is a problem with establishing damages on a class basis. Uh, if you go to the next slide, um, the, uh, the problem is at the certif uh, certification stage, which is an early stage of the class proceeding in Ontario, um, there are issues that um, have to be you have to demonstrate that uh, proceeding by way of a class action is the preferable uh, option in the circumstances. And one of the continuing problems um, in the, particularly the area of environmental law, is that um, when you're dealing with chronic or long-term damage uh, from health, uh, from uh, damage to health from exposure to toxic substances, the issue of whether the damages can be um, effectively uh, employed across the class becomes a major obstacle, and it's what has stopped a number of um, what would seem to be otherwise meritorious cases in Canada or in Ontario from going forward. So um, that is a key problem with class proceedings law um, uh, as, a, as a vehicle in uh, this particular context as well. Excellent. Juries, never, never seen one in a civil action. Um, they are extremely rare uh, in Canada. Uh, a jury obviously was what led to the success of the action in California. Uh, most jury trials, uh, sorry, uh, most um, civil trials in Ontario and most of the common law provinces are by judge alone. And judges have a, um, uh, not only a predisposition to award lower damages, they're also constrained by uh, appellate precedent uh, to do so as well, as the next slide shows. Supreme Court of Canada has long capped um, general damage awards, that's, that's essentially pain and suffering, at approximately $100,000 except in, in exceptional circumstances. The theory being that uh, once uh, the person is otherwise taken care of uh, in all other respects, uh, large additional amounts for awards are not merited. And um, the next slide, I think, will um, show the impact of that different approach. Um, the, um, the second bullet talks about uh, or refers to two different cases that occurred in the 1990s, one in British Columbia and one in Nevada, both dealing essentially with the same type of injury. In this, in this particular case, it was leaky breast implants. And um, the British Columbia court um, uh, awarded $100,000 in general damages, and that was actually upheld by the Supreme Court in Canada. And, uh, uh, in comparison, the Nevada court awarded uh, for general damages $4 million. Uh, the trial court in Nevada also awarded an additional $10 million in punitive damages, although that was reversed on appeal. But nonetheless, you can see the dramatic differential in awards um, for general damages in Canada can certainly be a constraint to considering an action here in comparison to considering, considering it in California. 700000 for the whole class? 
No, this was an this was an individual person. This was one thousand per person. Yes. Um, this is why again a class proceeding would be beneficial if you could combine um, that uh, that that, that, that uh, It fixes your damages problem, right? It does. It's hundred grand. It, it does if you can get over the other obstacle yeah, I referred yeah. to earlier. Um, next slide. So um, that's the general damages side. The situation with respect to punitive damages, which. Uh, as you know, in this case, in, uh, from the initial verdict of the jury, was the lion's share of the award, a quarter, uh, sorry, $250 million out of the $290 million. Um, our test for punitive damages here are probably not unlike uh, the test that, uh, that Brent described earlier, but nonetheless, our awards for punitive damages have been extremely low and certainly um, are not at a level that we would be sending any kind of money to a defendant in the circumstances of Ontario law. Uh, next slide. And finally, costs follow the event. Um, and uh, I've explained that earlier. The unsuccessful party in the lawsuit would have to pay the successful party um, legal fees, expert fees, and, and additional expenses. And that can have, obviously, a very chilling impact on plaintiffs considering suing, knowing, as they will know, that large corporations will defend these cases to the, uh, to the teeth. Uh, in, in considering what's at stake for them. Um, the um, next, slides, uh, next slide uh, actually talks about what needs to be done here. These are all law reform measures. They're not about what can be done in, uh, with existing law. Uh, so you can file these under uh, work to be done with Parliament or uh, to, uh, legislative assemblies across the country. But I, um, there's one other thing I did want to talk about um, um, which is not on the slide, and, and that's the issue of um, whether there's the uh, uh, Let me step back for a moment. Um, the case that uh, Johnson versus Monsanto is obviously a case involving an individual versus a company that manufa manufactured a design defective product. Um, there is also another form of lawsuit, uh, as you know, um, those of you who are lawyers in the office, uh, in, in the audience, um, where we would seek, one would seek to um, attempt to get the government to actually change its conduct with respect to the registration of a particular product. Um, and that has happened on, on certain occasions in Canada, and it has happened in relation to glyphosate. Um, what I'm speaking about generally is that, uh, as you know, uh, back in 2017, the um, uh, government finished its 15-year review of glyphosate and it was going to re-register all uh, uh, re-register with glyphosate for all the uses that were available to it uh, to the company, and then um, uh, that sparked, uh, as you know, a number of notices of objection under the federal pesticide statute, and they were just decided um, two weeks ago by uh, Health Canada. Uh, all were rejected, and um, basically uh, the, the government reaffirmed its position uh, that. Uh, glyphosate doesn't cause cancer. Um, that, so the question is, is that the end of the story from a sort of a, a, a judicial review standpoint, leaving the issue of uh, civil litigation aside for the moment? And I think the short answer is um, no, it doesn't. Um, there are some other options available uh, under the federal pesticide statute, which I think need to continue to be considered because um, at least one of them has a mandatory provision that uh, can't be wiggled out of as easily um, by the government agency as some of the other provisions. Um, that issue relates to the question of special reviews, which are uh, separate and apart from the notice of objection activity uh, that was attempted <coughs> a few years ago. Um, there are a couple of different provisions in the statute that allow for special reviews of substance, or of usually it's a, an active ingredient to be undertaken. And uh, one of them is um, if new information has come forward, and um, that was the basis for a case against uh, a Roundup, actually a glyphosate-related product in 2011 in, Cal uh, in, sorry, in British Columbia called Greer versus Canada. And um, in that case, the um, federal court required the minister to actually undertake the special review in respect of uh, water impacts associated with the use of glyphosate, which had not, had not been considered by the government up to that time, 
were apparently not going to be considered as part of the 15-year re-evaluation, and also because the government had not considered the fact that Australia had, uh, which is an OECD country, had banned uh, all those uses um, uh, prior to the application being abroad. So there is a mandatory provision in our federal pesticide law that says if an OECD member company prohibits the uses of all, uh, all uses of a particular um, active ingredient, then the Minister of Health is obliged to conduct a, a, a special review. Um, it's a possible vehicle for all the information that Brent and Michael have been talking about to be filed, not before a government agency, but before a court. And so that's, um, I guess the short answer is, if you know any of any OECD countries, uh, or you have any influence with any OECD countries, you want to urge them to consider uh, banning all uses of glyphosate for a particular use to see if we can actually get um, the matter before the Minister of Health, and if the Minister of Health refuses to deal with the matter before a federal court charge. I think I'll stop there. Is France an OECD? She, uh, they are. Just, yep, they just, <laughs> well, there you go. I didn't even have to wait to sit down. <laughs> <laughs> That's excellent. Great. Yeah. Okay, so we'll open up the floor to questions. Um, Kathy uh, will tell me if there are any online, and I will try to repeat the questions for the sake of the um, uh, YouTube audience. And. Um, I don't know everybody's names, but I'll try and remember faces. Uh, and so we'll do this for about 10 minutes, but we'll consider continue discussion um, with Meg's excellent guidance when we resume after that. So yeah. So I just had a quick question. Um, you've been mentioning over the last few days that you have some evidence of efforts to manipulate the peer-reviewed record. And we've noticed that just you know days or maybe a week ahead of a major decision, suddenly out of nowhere, there's some new study that got pushed through peer review, do, have you dug deeply enough to, to sort of see the web of that and and how trustworthy you know is the peer review process going to be into the future or has this been a window of of, the, of a naive time in which we could trust peer review and going forward we're seeing a manipulation by corporations of that peer review process. Right, so the short answer is there's a little bit of information about that uh, in the documents that are already disclosed on our website, the Monsanto Papers, and do look for Charles Healy. And Charles Healy uh, is a Monsanto employee who got himself in the position of being a peer reviewer for some uh, scientific journals and was funneling uh, uh, manuscripts that were under peer review to Donna Farmer and Bill Hydens inside Monsanto for them to write the, the peer review, trashing the uh, article and being the, the, the winning vote on uh, preventing the article from being published. So that's that's already there. Saltmire, Saltmire. I think it was Saltmire. Yeah, Saltmire. Yeah, Saltmire. Yeah, Saltmire. Yeah, Saltmire. Yeah, Saltmire. So uh, uh, there are new documents that are coming out that are related to that and uh, along with the, the Lamone stories um, that came out today, which you all should take a look at, uh, that are based on some of the new documents coming out. There's some additional documents uh, that are in there, and then there's some new ones that are not declassified yet that we still have more to, more to there is more You're basically there. supporting this hypothesis yes. that you must have had for a while that not only do we have data that has now not been published, so stories that, that are being canned, yeah. but also things that might not normally get through peer review are being pushed through. Yes. And vice versa. Yeah. And there's, like, <laughs> there, there's a dark underbelly to the academic peer review process. Yeah. And that is these journals, they don't work for us, they work for companies that want to publish. And the peer reviewers do not go through a proper conflicts of interest check before they're asked to peer review a paper. So what we're talking about with Dr. Healy is he was asked to do a peer review for a study that was critical of the health effects specifically of Roundup. And they were told by the editor, listen, we've had different peer reviews on this paper. Yours is the deciding vote. And then they come back three days later with a peer review with a scathing attack of the paper. They give it a five out of a hundred and recommend that it gets rejected. 
in that, uh, obviously it didn't get published, it'll never been published. And that's a pure comic book. He was working for Monsanto, peer reviewing an article about Roundup, instant safety. And so we see this not just in that example, but we see this in multiple examples that we're uncovering. And it seems to be that it's a kind of an epidemic within the peer review process. Okay, so great question. There's a question over here. Well, it's not so much a question as a comment. I'm not a lawyer, I'm a hobby farmer. And part of me thinks, why don't we actually treat Roundup as pesticides? Which is a strange comment to make. Yes, but pest why do we not treat Roundup as a pesticide? A pesticide has a pre harvest interval and a re entry period, and Roundup does not. Uh, Roundup is being used as a desiccant um, just prior to harvest. And some new information, glyphosate now has been found in our food chain, in breakfast cereals, and it's in our corn and the fruit. It's not a question of getting sprayed in Ecuador. It's in our food chain, and it's in us. And this is relatively new information. So um, this could be dealt with by giving glyphosate a pre-harvest interval so you could not, uh, by regulation, use it on crops prior to harvest. And a, and a decent re-entry period would protect people handling plants that are being sprayed. So those are my comments. Right, I take a pre-harvest interval, meaning there's a timeline, a, a time frame between the application of that chemical and harvesting the crop. Yes, and all, yeah. every pesticide has that pre-harvest interval. It's established to ensure that residual amounts of pesticides are either negligible or zero. But that's not the case with glyphosate. Okay, so another question or comment? Yeah. Can the results from the American action be brought to Ontario when our ministries use glyphosate products, but they're made by other companies and trademarked under different names? Well, I think it depends on what product is the source of your client's injury, right? The vast majority of glyphosate containing products are actually manufactured. So when you dealing with the glyphosate molecule or the product Roundup? Round, well, it was actually Roundup and another one called Razor Pro. Okay. But we know that about 40 to 49% of those products is glyphosate. Okay, and I just want to educate the audience that the men who used to sell these poisons under the Ontario Vegetation Management Association now enjoy key positions in our Ministry of Environment. And I've run into that very disheartenedly finding MTO doing a lot of damage with these products. Now we see the same thing in the state. Okay. okay, other questions or comments? Yep. Yeah. Were you guys able to find any evidence where Monsanto uh, conducted a study or hired someone to conduct a study and actually the numbers themselves and change like a you know, 3.1 to a 1.2 so that the result is different? Yes. Okay. Um, there, in fact, the first mouse study ever done involved the discovery of a tumor that would be solved to validate the results. They actually controlled, they fabricated the existence of a tumor uh, using experts and a whole host. It's a, whole, it's a long story, but the answer is yes. We also see that in um, some dermal absorption studies. For example, they hired a, a company in Europe to do dermal absorption study, and the results were showing a penetration rate of over 10%. And Monsanto's, and all of the regulatory standards are based on an absorption rate of less than 1%. So this was 10 times worse, so this would destroy all of the labeling requirements. It wouldn't be pre-harvest anymore. I mean, it would, it would create all these problems for it. And they literally shut the study down and buried it. We have the entire email chain where they're saying, this isn't meeting our objectives, we're stopping it now. And then the company came back and said, well, we'll do it again if you think we messed up. And they said, no, <laughs> stop. And they buried it. And we've actually discovered that and never submitted it to the regulatory agencies. So we do have examples of them actually monkeying with science in the process. Um, and also with another genotox study, they got the results from their lab and they didn't like them. So they threw them away and did it again until they got a result they liked, and then they submitted it to the experts. So we have some examples. So I have a question before I go back to uh, the floor, um, which is you've mentioned a couple of times the process of declassifying documents so that you can post them on your firm's website for all of us to take a look. 
And what is that process? In, in Canada, at least under the Ontario rules, documents disclosed to us through discovery um, cannot be disclosed to the public. There's an, well, an explicit requirement under the rules not to do that. So it would only be if they were actually submitted in evidence and became exhibits that we would have the ability to do that here. Um, and uh, I don't even know if we could get a court ruling allowing us to do that in, in other circumstances than, than becoming you know, public exhibits in a trial. So what process do you go through to be able to do that? So the, uh, the first one you identified was if it becomes an exhibit and a, uh, a motion or a trial that has a, um, an impact on uh, like a motion for summary judgment. So then it becomes public then. Okay. But that's not what, that's, that's how all the documents that are uh, on our website that are exhibits to the trial, they became public when they became, they were exhibits to the trial. Uh, there's another process. We get the documents under what's called a protective order. They give us the documents and they stamp classified or confidential on all the documents. The protective order says that, um, they only get to maintain confidentiality on uh, documents that are legitimately confidential that have trade secrets. In them. And the, our protect, we write the protective orders and then negotiate those with the defendants. And the, the protective orders say that if a document, we feel a document is not legitimately a trade secret, we can advise the defendant that they are not trade secrets and they have 14 days to meet and confer with us over whether they're going to continue to maintain the confidentiality of the document and or documents and uh, at that meet and confer they'll either ask us to redact some email addresses or they'll redact some pieces of the document or they'll say oh no that document that's a trade seeker it's not coming in at all and then we'll say well we challenge that and when we challenge that in that meet and confer, they have 14 days to write uh, a motion. Oh, no, first we have to identify the documents to the judge. Uh, on a, they give them the judge the Bates number of those documents, identifying numbers on them. And then they have 14 days after that to write a motion to the judge asserting the basis for why it's a trade seeker or why it ought to be protected or there's some, you know, some basis for asserting confidentiality. And uh, the ones that they don't do that challenge to are declassified, or if they agree to declassify it, they're declassified. And then it goes to the judge, and the judge looks at it, and the judge says, nah, that's not, that's not a trade secret, that's not a trade secret, that is. And then they come out and that's Okay, thank you, that's, that's interesting. Okay, so at first I'm gonna say goodbye to the YouTube audience. Um, so thank you very much for your participation, and uh, uh, we hope it's been a useful process for you, and uh, look forward to future events with, uh, with CELA, and thanks again to Friends of the Earth for uh, bringing our American friends to shed some very interesting light on uh, this precedent-setting case uh, around pesticide health effects. So I'm going to take two more questions, but the discussion is not over. We're going to resume after a quick uh, 